Unplugged In. 2020 is finally over. 2021 begins with optimism that new vaccines to wipe out COVID-19 can return us to a more familiar way of life. So we are in a good place to begin to see how we might get COVID-19 behind us, but it's gonna take a lot of months to get there for everybody. Americans elect Joe Biden, the next US president, on the promise to restore America's health and economy and return to global alliances. Every leader of every country puts their own country first. The question is, how do you do it? Before we build for 2021, we look back at the year that was. Unplugged in 2020, a year in review. Hello and welcome to Plugged In. I'm Greta Van Susteren reporting from Washington. For many of us, 2020 could not have ended quickly enough. When 2020 began, the assumption was the presidential election would be the year's biggest storyline. Little did we know that before 2020 began, a flu-like infection that started in China would erupt into a pandemic infecting more than 75 million and killing more than 1.6 million people in 220 countries. The pandemic's impact on the global economy and the education of more than a billion students will be felt for years to come. VOA correspondent Steve Barragona begins our look back at 2020. The failures began while the coronavirus was shutting down cities in China and Europe, says Georgetown University health law expert Lawrence Gostin. We didn't prepare. We, we knew this was coming. We should have known. We should have been prepared. Uh, when it did hit, the first major problem that arose was testing. The first test from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention did not work. Then, months of shortages, backlogs, and long waits for results let the virus get out of hand. It did not help that President Donald Trump repeatedly undermined his own health officials, says University of Michigan science historian Howard Markell. This wasn't an administration that was used to dealing with experts or not only not, didn't appreciate them, didn't even respect them. When CDC's experts recommended in April that everyone wear cloth masks, Trump read the announcement and then undercut it. So it's voluntary. You don't have to do it. They suggest it for a period of time. But uh, this is voluntary. I don't think I'm going to be doing it. Masks quickly became something Democrats embraced and Republicans resisted, never mind the science. Polarized politics also muddled the difficult balance between protecting health and the economy. Trump and Republicans mostly sided with the economy. You like in April, when Trump backed protests against coronavirus restrictions, but only in states with Democratic governors. When the president of the United States urges insurrection against those measures, um, that's not a small thing. Um, that is a devastating blow to the ability of our nation's leaders and public health agencies to actually fight this pandemic. Given his opposition to prevention measures, it's perhaps not surprising that Trump caught the virus himself in late September. But it's not just leaders to blame, Gustin says. We just seem to be, as a nation, incapable of doing the little things that would keep each other safe, like masks or distancing. From college spring breaks in March to Thanksgiving travel in November, Americans ignoring public health warnings have kept the virus going. On the other hand, the American government has put billions of dollars into developing a coronavirus vaccine, which is now paying off, Gostin says. And America is now um, in the forefront on vaccine development, along with other countries. Um, and, and it could be our saving grace. Vaccines from drug companies Pfizer and Moderna were developed faster than ever before, with others right behind them. As the year of the pandemic ends, the vaccines that may end the pandemic begin to arrive. Steve Barragona, VOA News. Almost a year into the coronavirus pandemic, the first of the vaccines are being administered. A week before her 91st birthday, Britain's Margaret Keenan became the first person to be vaccinated. In the U.S., medical and emergency workers, along with nursing home residents, are first in line to be vaccinated. Dr. Francis Collins has been director of the National Institute of Health since August 2009. He is respected for his work in the field of genetics. 
we spoke about the effectiveness of this new generation of vaccines. Doctor, nice to talk to you, sir. Nice to talk to you, Greta. Well, we Americans know what NIH is and we're very proud of it, but what is NIH? The National Institutes of Health, it's the largest supporter of biomedical research in the world. Uh, basically, everything that the U.S. is doing in terms of research in academic institutions, institutes, and our own intramural program is funded by the taxpayers uh, through this budget. And I'm the director that's supposed to make sure it gets spent wisely. Everything from basic science to clinical trials, diabetes, rare diseases, cancer, and of course, right now, COVID-19. And that's what we are all about, $42 billion a year. I spoke to Dr. Fauci, who works at NIH uh, several times, but very early on, and we were talking about vaccines, and he said he would be very hopeful with a, with a uh, protection of 50, and that he'd be thrilled with 70. Now we're reading, you know, 94, 95-ish, um, is that, you know, the flu isn't that good. The flu vaccine doesn't do that well. It is astounding what's been done here, Greta, because <clears throat> traditionally it takes eight to 10 years to develop a vaccine against a new pathogen. This has been done in less than a year. The U.S. government pulled all of the resources together to make sure the coordination was happening. Operation Warp Speed made it possible also to get rid of some of those long delays that oftentimes vex the process, where you go to phase one and then you have to wait many months before you go to phase two. All of those things were synchronized in an unprecedented way, but not by doing any compromising at all on safety. With efficacy over 90%, which is better than most of us had dared to hope, and safety record that also looks extremely good. So we are in a good place to begin to see how we might get COVID-19 behind us, but it's gonna take a lot of months to get there for everybody. All right, Moderna and Pfizer, as I understand it, both have something called, or the sort of the science behind it is something called messenger RNA. Are they very different vaccines or very similar? They're quite similar. Basically, messenger RNA is the part of a nucleic acid that codes for protein. And this is a very clever way to make a vaccine where you basically synthesize that messenger RNA that has the right information in it, inject that into muscle. Muscle goes, oh, I know what to do with messenger RNA. I'll make a protein. And so it does, and it makes the spike protein, which is the stuff that decorates the coronavirus. And those spike proteins the immune system says, oh, no, you don't, and makes an antibody to them. And it's very quick. Do AstraZeneca and the Johnson Johnson have the same uh, messenger RNA approach to a vaccine, or are they different vaccines? They're using a different approach, one that has been tried and true in other situations, takes a little longer. It basically captures the energy of a different virus, an adenovirus, just as a carrier, a delivery truck and uses that also to deliver the coding for this spike protein. So it's making the same kind of uh, response happen in the immune system, but it's getting it in in a different way. And this is something that's been done successfully for Ebola. So we know this vector system is likely to be safe and effective. The Johnson & Johnson one also is a single dose, which will be very much easier to manage, whereas Pfizer and Moderna requires two doses, one on day one, another one three or four weeks later. It's a little more complicated to set that up. We'd love it if we had at least one of these that was just one dose and you're done. You know, I'm old enough to remember landing on the moon. That was such a huge game changer, you know, for the United States. I likewise see this. I mean, moving so quickly in a vaccine, something that is, you know, that is terrorizing the world. I mean, it, it really is quite extraordinary, isn't it? It is, Greta. And, you know, 2020 has been just a terrible year for so many people with the suffering and death of this terrible pandemic, with the economic distress it's caused. And I must say, for science, it has been a challenge like one we've really not quite had to deal with before for, for life science. And it is really wonderful to see the way science has come forward. All of the partners in industry and in academia and government working together in an unprecedented way, not worrying too much about who's going to get the credit to make these things happen at a scale and a timetable that was unimaginable before. And I hope that's being noticed. And I hope a lot of young people watching that might have the same reaction they did uh, when we went to the moon saying, that looks like fun. I want to be part of that too, because we have a lot more science to do in the future. Thank you, sir. All right. Thank you. The coronavirus pandemic had a major impact on the 2020 U.S. presidential election. 
The pandemic and its impact was issue one from how candidates campaign to how Americans voted. President-elect Joe Biden also campaigned on a promise to ensure full inclusion and gender equality. More from VOA White House correspondent Patsy Widakuswara. While the data is not yet final, there is no doubt that women helped secure Joe Biden's electoral victory. 57% of women voted for Biden, compared to 42% for President Donald Trump, according to exit polls by Edison Research. Since becoming president-elect, Biden has nominated women to fill key cabinet positions. And while this team has unmatched experience and accomplishments, they also reflect the idea that we cannot meet these challenges with old thinking and unchanged habits. For example, we're going to have the first woman lead the intelligence community. If approved by the Senate, that woman would be Avril Haines, Biden's choice for Director of National Intelligence. Biden also picked women to serve as Treasury Secretary, UN Ambassador, Director of the Office of Management and Budget, and as Chair of his Economic Advisors. His senior communications team will be all-female, including Press Secretary Jen Psaki. Vice President-elect Kamala Harris will bring her own team of women, including Tina Flournoy, as Chief of Staff. These women also represent various racial and economic backgrounds and include daughters of working class and immigrant families. Activists say this diversity will help Biden achieve key priorities, racial and gender equity. We're really looking for people to be at the top levels of government who are not only experienced and um, established and expert in their field, but who have the experiences of the communities that they are serving, that they're intended to serve, so that they can truly make the best decisions on behalf of the American people and the communities that most need um, those supports and those programs. Biden's agenda for women includes improving economic security through equal pay and ending pregnancy discrimination, work-family balance including parental leave and child care, access to health care, ending violence against women, and empowering women around the world. Having female decision makers is seen as especially crucial as the country faces the pandemic and tries to recover economically. We can look back and see just how important it is, for example, that we've had black women in positions of public health leadership or as mayors of big cities who have said, look, there's a disproportionate effect on black communities and even on black women economically in this moment. And they are making sure that policy is reflective of those distinctive challenges. To enact his ambitious agenda for women, Biden will need to overcome partisan gridlock in Congress, where his Democratic Party has a narrow majority in the House of Representatives and Republicans may keep control of the Senate. Patsy Widakuswara, VOA News. 2020 was an historic year for the United States Congress. From a Senate impeachment trial of President Trump, that seems so long ago, to passing the largest financial aid package in U.S. history. VOA congressional correspondent Katherine Gibson shows us how American lawmakers adapted during the pandemic. The impeachment of U.S. President Donald Trump consumed Congress as 2020 began. Donald Trump is going to get away with abusing his position of power in just the third Senate impeachment trial in American history, Trump was ultimately acquitted of charges he leveraged U.S. aid to Ukraine to target political rival Joe Biden. President of the United States is not guilty as charged in the first article of impeachment. While history may not remember or might be a footnote about exactly why he was impeached, I think the Democrats were trying to lay the groundwork or at least plant their flag that this president uh, deserved to be impeached. But the coronavirus pandemic quickly overwhelmed political debate. By late March, lockdowns to stop the spread of the virus had endangered the U.S. economy, pushing Congress to pass the largest aid package in American history. Lives are at stake. This is not a time for name calling or playing politics. Passage of the $3 trillion CARES Act was a rare moment of agreement in 2020. When Congress wants to do something, even an incredibly expensive package that has a litany of, of uh, provisions in it that touch basically all factors of the economy, when they want to do something, they can. But Congress struggled to adapt to new ways of operating to avoid the virus. 
the United States Congress was one of the last institutions to make any adjustments. And even when they did with some remote hearings and some limited remote voting, those accommodations were very temporary and definitely not fully embraced by all members of Congress. No justice, no peace. In June, amid nationwide protests over the death of George Floyd while in police custody, lawmakers failed to pass an ambitious police reform proposal. The country has given us the opportunity to lead to lead and my friends on the other side just said no. Frustration continued as lawmakers failed for months to agree on another round of coronavirus aid. Democrats' $3 trillion HEROES Act failed in the Senate where Republicans warned of overspending. I don't think the current situation demands uh, multi-trillion dollar uh, package. So I think it should be highly targeted. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. In October, Judge Amy Coney Barrett confirmed to the U.S. Supreme Court by the Republican Majority Senate against Democratic objections. The Republican Senate majority decided to thwart the will of the people and confirm a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court in the middle of a presidential election that election decided the next occupant of the White House, Democrat Joe Biden. But 2020 closed with more uncertainty on Capitol Hill. Runoff elections in January for Georgia's two Senate seats will decide which party will control the Senate for the next two years. Katherine Gibson, VOA News, Washington. Beyond the pandemic's impact on America's health and wealth, President-elect Biden has indicated changes ahead in the way America engages with the rest of the world. Michael O'Hanlon is a senior fellow and director of foreign policy research at the Brookings Institution. We spoke about the global challenges ahead for the incoming Biden administration. How do you factor in the fact that uh, Iran's top scientist has recently been assassinated? Iran has at least said that it is uh, further enriching uranium in response to that, that they're thinking about in February not letting inspectors in. You've got the uh, you got Russia saying that Israel is the problem in the Middle East. So, you know, how do, how do you factor all that? In the I think in the end, they will watch out for their own national interest with or without this scientist being alive. And, uh, and so I think what you're going to see is Iran try to figure out how the world reacts if and when Biden... Uh, comes in and says, you know, the 2015 deal was pretty good for the time. The times are different, and I need, I need something a little broader and longer lasting. And uh, at first, that will not be something Iran wants to hear, and Iran will test the waters to see if America's European allies, as well as Russia and China, uh, will really go along with that approach, or maybe if the United States can be isolated uh, in its desire for a broader arrangement. So that'll, I think, be the initial conversation uh, I think it's going to be fascinating to watch. One of the problems that has troubled every recent American president is North Korea and its nuclear weapon ambition. And no one has seemed to be able to figure out how to handle North Korea and now Kim Jong-un. We've, we've, we've ignored him. We've had sanctions. We, uh, president Trump tried to talk to him, tried to make almost friends with him. Um, what will President Biden do about North Korea because it is marching forward with its nuclear weapon program and its missile program. So what I hope Biden will do is pick up on the notion that, first of all, high level engagement with Kim Jong Un or his government is a good idea. I'm not suggesting that Biden should have summit diplomacy without any deliverables, but there should be intense high level engagement with people who can speak for the president of the United States and make a deal. And then secondly, we need to be flexible and realistic about what that deal could entail. We need a little bit of the art of the deal, even though Donald Trump himself could not deliver that deal. And I think it means accepting and acknowledging North Korea is not going to give up all of its nuclear weapons right away. They have too much fear about attack. That is too much a legacy of the father and grandfather of Kim Jong-un. We need a partial deal that in the, in the short term freezes North Korea's ability to make any more bombs. And then in return for that, there's a partial lifting of sanctions and you leave the longer term disarmament for the longer term. 
I think if, if Biden can be pragmatic in that regard, he has much better prospects for success. Finally, Russia. Uh, will we see a different approach uh, with a President Biden towards uh, Putin and Russia than we've seen with a President Trump? You know, Biden's been a supporter of expanding NATO and bringing it eastward. And we've promised to someday bring uh, Ukraine and Georgia, former Soviet republics, into NATO. That is just, as you know, so incendiary for the Russians. And so Biden's going to have to be, I think, a little bit clever. Because if he leaves the basic strategy as it's been, keep trying to expand NATO to the east, for example. Um, and then, of course, face down Putin, where you do have to challenge him on issues like Russian tinkering in our elections, Russian suppression of its own democracy, Russian aggression in the broader Middle East. Those issues, we have to oppose Putin. But if you also continue to try to push the idea of eventual NATO expansion, then I think you're guaranteeing a bad relationship with Russia. So what I'm hoping is that Biden will have a new vision for European security, especially for the neutral or non-aligned countries that include the former Soviet republics I just mentioned, as well as some other places like Armenia and Azerbaijan, even down to Cyprus, even up to Finland and, uh, and Sweden, and try to think of how we can stabilize that zone and also get Russia to stop aggressing against Ukraine and find a, a new stable concept for Europe. Michael, thank you very much. Always nice to talk to you. Brada, thanks for having me on. Among the legacies of President Donald Trump, securing historic diplomatic agreements between Israel and several of its Arab neighbors. But the recent assassination of a top Iranian nuclear scientist is raising the tensions in the Middle East. VOA White House correspondent Patsy Wida Kuswara looks at the Trump legacy in the region and the challenges ahead for the incoming Biden administration. The Abraham Accords normalizing Israel's relations with the United Arab Emirates and Bahrain signed in September <laughs> is widely seen as President Donald Trump's most significant foreign policy achievement. After decades of division and conflict, we mark the dawn of a new Middle East. The Accords altered the decades-long regional perception that Arab-Israeli peace cannot be achieved without first addressing statehood for Palestinians. They also reflect Israel's improving ties with its Arab neighbors as they face Iran, a mutual enemy weakened by Trump's maximum pressure campaign of sanctions. President-elect Joe Biden has said he supports more countries recognizing Israel with a caveat for the Palestinians' plight. Also, I believe that Israel has to be prepared to work toward a genuine two-state solution. Biden has promised to return to the 2015 JCPOA agreement, which Trump withdrew from in 2018. The deal suspends Iran's nuclear program in exchange for sanctions relief. The plan may be complicated by the recent assassination of Iran's top nuclear scientists. The White House has not condemned the attack, which Tehran blames on Israel. What I suspect will happen is the Iranians are going to keep a, uh, restrain themselves the way they did after the assassination of Hassan Soleimani and wait for the Biden administration to come in and see if they can cut some kind of deal with him, although that will be a very thorny process in itself. Um, but the fact is Iran cannot afford a military conflict at this point with uh, U.S. or Israel, or for that matter, anybody else. While Trump prefers bilateral relations often based on personal ties with foreign leaders, Biden is expected to adopt a more multilateral approach in engaging allies. Still, analysts do not expect a fundamental change in U.S. policy in the region. But certainly a different tone um, and a different type of engagement um, I think the people, particularly those who are active in human rights and democracy um, in the region, will very much look forward to those two issues becoming important once again um, for the United States, not to promote aggressively, but at least to support. Like Trump, Biden has pledged to end forever wars in the Middle East and Afghanistan, focusing only on al-Qaeda and Islamic State terror groups. <laughs> and ending support for the Saudi-led war in Yemen. Analysts warn that a decreased military presence in the region has repercussions. That could be a lessened influence in the Middle East, and it could be resurgent ISIS, it could be uh, our enemies uh, coming uh, into play in the Middle East. So, so there's a lot of things to consider 
that um, that the president is going to have to deal with within the, the coming year. In his early months, Biden will likely focus on the domestic pandemic response, including vaccine distribution, delegating much of foreign policy to his pick for Secretary of State. Anthony Blinken has worked with Biden for nearly 20 years, including on Middle East policies, with mixed results in Egypt, Iraq, Syria, and Libya. Pat Siwida Kuswara, VOA News. Social media networks struggling to deal with an increasing amount of misinformation and hateful content that is being passed, shared around the world. Top executives seem to be caught off guard when their platforms created to connect people are used for malicious purposes. Silicon Valley, California, hub of America's technology industry, is preparing for the new Biden administration as it faces pressure on antitrust, online speech, and digital privacy issues. VOA technology correspondent Michelle Quinn reports. My fellow citizens, I stand here to... When President Barack Obama took office in 2009, a close relationship bloomed between Washington and Silicon Valley. Flash forward 12 years. On January 20, Obama's Vice President Joe Biden is set to become the next U.S. President. This time, however, the relationship will be different. Even as a member of the Obama administration, I will say there was a soft spot uh, for Silicon Valley that perhaps was more of a blind spot. Uh, I don't think you're going to see that here. I think people's eyes are wide open in this administration. What's changed? Tech grew. It became the center of the global economy, shaping commerce, online speech, workplaces. In recent years, elected officials and activists have complained about so-called big tech over issues such as competition and digital privacy. During the presidential campaign, Biden's team criticized Facebook for misinformation on the site, and candidate Biden talked about creating an economy that worked more fairly for more people, a sign some say the president-elect will be interested in looking at tech's power. Biden might continue to scrutinize tech firms as the Trump administration, U.S. states, and congressional leaders have done over allegations of anti-competitive behavior. We are particularly concerned about competition and the power of the largest tech platforms. And I am looking forward to um, more attention on those issues in the Biden administration. For its part, the tech industry is prepared for any scrutiny it may receive. These tech companies have gotten so big because they give customers what they want. So I'm very much mindful and appreciative of the fact, and a lot of people in America are too, I think that these companies are prepared for that kind of scrutiny, and I'm sure that they will be very forthcoming in going over their, all their business practices. With a Biden administration, Silicon Valley has some things on its wish list. A national privacy law and changes in immigration rules to name just two. Tech critics and tech itself want to get more people online, particularly in rural America. The president-elect is reportedly working with Democratic lawmakers to prepare a massive increase in federal broadband spending. In rural America, uh, you know, there is not even a network to connect to, right? There's not even a broadband network if you want, if you had the money to connect to, but also deal with the problem, which is frankly much bigger of people who can't afford broadband because it's too expensive. As the new administration comes in, all eyes will be on how the relationship between Silicon Valley and Washington unfolds. Michelle Quinn, VOA News, Oakland, California. That's all the time we have for today. 2020 has finally gone. It was an historic year, one that will be talked about for generations to come. 2021 is here with a chance for a new beginning, an opportunity to find hope and optimism. Thank you for being with us and thank you for being plugged in and Happy New Year.